Hello, I'm Klaus Mürer. Today I'm presenting you our research paper, Domino, Visual Causal Reasoning with Time-Dependent Phenomena. It's research I did with Jun Wang, former PhD student of mine, who has since graduated. And we are both from Stony Brook University. Enjoy the show. So this paper is about temporal causality. So, and basically it's defined as an event, the cause that precedes another event, the effect in time which means that the cause comes before the event. That's the definition of temporal causality. But relevant is also the time delay. Like let's say if smoking causes cancer in 100 years, then who cares, right? Keep, just keep on smoking. But if it causes cancer in 10 years, giving it up might be a very wise thing to do. So I'd like to show you here what it means time delay, right? When you see this, it the time delay was short enough for all those dominoes until the one that doesn't fall anymore. The other time delay was longer, or in this case, the spatial delay. And that's the whole point of this, right? You need to set the right time delay to figure out cause and effect. So what's a reasonable time delay? Like it's up to analysts really, like, you know, whatever the analyst thinks should be the right time delay, he can inspect that. And domino lets the analyst explore the causes and effects within specific time windows that the analyst can set. It starts with a time series data and then allows analysts to extract events that fit this constraint. So mapping these events to cause and effects, that's basically the main task here. And an event is considered a potential cause if it elevates the event after a certain time delay. And then it's scored against other potential causes to test if it's actually a better explanation for those other causes or not, right? And we actually give all the different causes that could cause, that could cause an effect. And we, we give the significance levels for that. So frequent analytical tasks in temporal causality are really like first, generate causal propositions, hypotheses that can be tested. Then identify significant causes under specified time delay and analyze the change of causal influences over time. These are like three main tasks. But this can be tedious due to variation significance levels, event characterization, and time delays. Like you really can't do this all fully automatically, right? You need a human in a loop to figure out what really matters and what doesn't, what doesn't, right? But of course, this should be supported by automation. Otherwise, it becomes a daunting task, right? So there's basically both human in a loop and some amount of automation to reduce the burden. So what we use is what's called logic-based causality, which is invented by Gleinberg and Mishra in 2009. Their paper is mostly a theoretical contribution with some case studies, but there wasn't really any true system to actually make it available to, to a real world application. And basically what this is really about is, a, we just look at the univariate case in the first, first two lines. Potential cause basically is when the probability of an event is less than P, and, and probability of an event given a cause is greater than P, right? So that basically, and where P is the threshold or the P significance that we have. And this is for discrete event, but there's also continuous, for continuous case, that's basically now expectations. Expectation of the continuous variable event, right? Is un, is not equal to the, the, the same level when the cause is present. Right, so basically you measure the, diff the, the difference of that, right? It can be higher or lower, doesn't matter. It just has to be different. And then for multivariate data, really, all you really do is like extend this to multiple causes, and causes uh, multiple, multiple uh, variables, covariates, right? So basically you test, every time you test the event, probability of the event, when cause and the covariate is available, is, is, is present at the same time, minus the probability when the covariate is present, but the cause is not, okay? And then you do this for every covariate in the set, except the cause, of course, and normalize it. And that's going to give you the absolute average cause and event. And the same thing also applies to continuous case. Basically, now you just have this continuous variable VE, but at the same conditions like C, and X has to be present minus the cause is not present and X is present, right? The same thing. So this, this becomes this epsilon. So this, this is basically a condition you're gonna measure under a particular time delay. So let's look at this a little more concretely, what this really means, right? So you'll see like we have a data set, we have a se several data sets, but here let's look at this one data set we, we have used, which is the measures the air pollution in Shanghai, right? There's a data set that measures how much PM 2.5 arrives in Shanghai, and this is sampled at an hourly rate, okay? 
and uh, at the U.S. Embassy, <clears throat> which is PM Post. Okay, so now this 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 time sequence view is from our interface, <clears throat> and we'll basically find out. Let's look at what it has. Why it has the first? It's the effect variable. It's the first sequence here over from Tuesday 13th to Tuesday 29th and the PM25 pollution at the US Embassy in Shanghai. And it varies, so it goes up and down, right? Then we have a cause, a possible cause, of a cause, of a cause variable, which is the wind direction. This is color coded. For example, the orange one is the Northeast and the, the green one is Northwest and the red one is Southeast. And there's also C when there's no blue, when there's no wind present at all, right? So this is the, basically the measurements here at an hourly rate. And there's also wind speed, like wind speed also varies over time. So let's look, just look at these three variables. Then what we'll see at one point, we'll see that that the wind from Northwest, when it's green, has is raising the pollution, right? The wind is poison pollution at a specified time delay, right? It's actually going from a small amount to a larger amount. At the same time, Northeast actually, you know, reduces it in some sense, right? It actually, or does if or at least it doesn't really change, but it, usually it reduces it, right? There's a mitigating effect, right? And this isn't just like, you know, this is just two examples, but this is really consistent behaviors. You can look through this time sequence and you find multiple, you find multiple evidences for this, okay? And when you explain this on a map, you can see this, like this is the neighborhood of Shanghai from the Northwest, all these cities and which, which create pollution. And from the northeast is the ocean, which does, which has usually clean air, right? So that makes sense, right? Northwest, southwest causes pollution in Shanghai, and northeast, southeast cleans it out, you know. So in some sense, right? This so it makes it has a perfect physical mapping, right? So let's see our interactive interface, what it looks like, right? So this is the whole dashboard, the way it looks like, and I'll go explain components one by one. We have always seen the time, the time continuous display. So this is the conditional distribution view, right? Again, the aim is to find the causes for air pollution in Shanghai, right? This is the conditional distribution view. This is where analysts can manually specify these things, right? So here, first thing, what the analyst will do, he'll 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 specify the effect variable among all these variables. And here we use the pollution, the PM PMS post, right? The, the US post at the at the US embassy, the hourly measured PM25 uh, concentration. So we'll fix that. Then we'll look at the cause levels. The wind direction will pick like for many causes. We'll pick the wind direction and and post this hypothesis, and they'll mark certain levels, which is the north the northwest wind, the southwest wind, and the no wind at all. Right? These are basically the levels we're going to examine, and then we'll specify a time delay, which is in this case five units. Okay. Then we'll look at this histogram here. Right? This histogram is very important. Right? This histogram basically tells you. The, the, the histogram of the pollution, right? The x-axis is the pollution. And the blue is the overall, right? That's like basically an hourly measurements. This is the histogram of pollution that have been measured at the US Embassy. And the green is the one when the cause was, only when the cause was present. Whenever the cause was five, five units before, we measure the pollution at that particular point, right? Minus five units before, then five minutes, five units later, we'll measure the PM. PM25, right? And then report the level and put it in the histogram. Obviously, there's fewer green bars than blue bars because the cause isn't always present, right? Because, you know, the, that's why there's fewer. But you can also see something very interesting, right? That the, the new is actually the, the average of the when the cause is present is, is 117.95, while when the cause wasn't present, like for overall, it could be present or not, but overall it's 86.12, right? So the new <clears throat> is the average is significantly higher. You can actually do a P test, a T test on this. You report the P value. Basically, you can see this. So basically the conclusion is really that the, the three levels, right, that were tested here, that were included in this test, right? No wind, wind from Northwest and wind from Southwest. Whenever that happens, the air pollution is higher. And this is a statistical significant assessment, okay? So this is the conditional conditional distribution through, right? And then you can click this add button to add it to the to the set of variables that are causes, right? So now we put this here again, and we'll put this here, right? So this is basically our causal inference panel where we report on the causes and how significant they were, right? So here we see this, this wind direction here on the bottom, right? The wind direction is pretty 
significant, right? Southwest wind is there, northwest wind is there, no wind is there, right? And then you could do this for other variables too, right? Temperature, wind direction, and so on, right? Uh, wind speed, and so on. But it tends to be a little tedious. So we have a little bit, we have a little bit, um, you know, we have a little bit, uh, uh, we have an automated algorithm that estimates the causes using a clustering approach. So we can read about this in a paper, how it exactly works. But now it's actually doing this automatically. It figures out all under the given time delay, which is five in this case, or oh, um, which is seven, seven in this case, uh, because we said it here, um, it'll figure out these, these, the, these, um, these, these specific causes and then it adds it to this interface here, right? So we'll see it also determined temperature, high temperature was a was an absolute significant cause, not as significant as the, the wind direction, but but just still significant. Low pressure is another one, no precipitation is another one, mid-level humidity, and then wind speed, right? Wind speed has to be low, right? So so you know, at different levels of epsilon. So wind direction is the most important one, but but temperature and pressure are also important variables, right? So, so this is basically now completes this here, right? So let's have a little bit of a look at this at this area chart on top, which is actually pretty serves an important purpose. So let's have a look a little bit at it. Okay. So basically, it allows the user to do a quick exploration of time delays. Like here, in this case, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the effect. And red is when the effect decrease is what matters. And green is when the effect increase is what matters. Right in this case, increase of pollution was was what we wanted to see. In this case, a decrease. And we'll here we're looking at the influence of regular insulin and ultra lente insulin on glucose levels. So here with insulin, we're interested in what reduces the glucose levels. Right. So we're looking at the decrease is on, the decrease of the variable, which is glucose level, is the effect variable. We are looking at the decrease, and here notice we we inverted the the, the, the level the the, uh, the the range in the in the y-axis. Right, we're going from low glucose level, like we're going from high glucose levels to low glucose levels because we're looking to decrease the glucose. Right, we inverted that. We're going from one thirty to one o five. Right, and we look at this time delay equals one. Right, and we'll learn like we can specify different time delays, and we learn how the glucose level changes over different time delays, right? In this case, we looked at time 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 delay was one, right? And we learned that regular insulin has a high effect, right? So the normal levels and high levels have a high absolute significance. And it actually is able to decrease the glucose. To see this at this donut chart, be able to see it actually decreases the glucose level from 134, which is when you don't take any glucose in insulin to a level of 111.58, right? So this is good. But now let's see, there is actually a better way to do this. Like what could be the variables here, right? Like when you go and move it to 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 uh, t equals four, right? Then we learn when you when you look at this, you learn that actually now ultra lente insulin is the is the decisive uh, factor, no longer regular, right? And if you know a little bit of medical, which I which I learned about on the internet right now. Ultra lente is basically a zinc-based insulin, which has a prolonged effect, but right? it kicks in a little later. But it has a it kicks, it, it has a max more effect, but right? a bigger effect. So basically, you can now prove this with a temporal analysis, right? You can see ultra lente now is after when T equals four using this area chart. You can just play around, you can just set it here and then estimate the causes and the and the and the effect that they have. And then please look at this in this absolute significance chart. And then you'll see also in the donut chart that it now that glucose has decreased to 102, uh, 0.21, and no, and, and much better actually, right? So you so it's just another another example in which this domino system can be used to un unveil, reveal these, these time varying causes, right? So then the last thing we have is this causal flow chart. And this is actually here in this interface here. So what it does really, it allows the analyst to develop a temporal causal network. So basically you iteratively examine different, different effects, look at the causes, then sort of line them up along time on the axis is the time, right? So you basically may have found first pressure and looked at temperature and wind direction and wind speed that they have an effect on pressure. Then you look at pressure, temperature, wind direction, precipitation, and see how they have an effect on, 
on on the on the uh, pollution and then you might take wind direction you might find that wind directional pollution at the US embassy have an effect on the pollution at Exui which is another town in near Shanghai right so so another place near Shanghai so basically you kind of develop this causal flowchart like this this domino kind of effect remember like temperature domino kicks the pressure domino kicks the pollution domino kicks the other pollution domino right you can sort of see how they work how these dominoes work together to cause to cause the pollution at particular down downstream place right so that's basically how this uh, this flow chart is is used and yep oh i showed you basically this one right here then from here and then you go here so this is basically the development of the flow chart. So we did a user study to test if this uh, domino system actually is useful. So we, we went and recruited five junior PhD scientists from our university. They were participating in a specific program for highly, highly skilled uh, junior PhD scientists uh, called the STRIKE program. And, and their fields were technology policy innovation, Another student came from chemical engineering. One of them came from operations research. Another one from climate atmospheric science, and one came from computer science. Right. So each session lasted about one one to one point five hours. We did this on Zoom, and the data set we tested was the air quality data set, and and basically the study went really well. Right. The average system usability score uh, was actually sixty eight, which is pretty good. Right. But there was only one participant was a little bit of an outlier participant number four. And then we talked to that person later on and it turned out that person was a little, was a little less quantitative, but more, 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 it was less data driven, right? Didn't, didn't really, doesn't really that data driven, was more qualitative. So, and uh, that explained it, right? So, but the other ones did really well. Okay. Actually, this person also did find something, just wasn't really overly convinced, wanted to more like measure something like and see it with their own eyes. So basically, you can read a lot more in a paper that you can get from this web page, right? We only, I only want to scratch the surface. I have more case studies in this paper and we have more, more explanations on how it all works. And I encourage you to read this. Thank you.